Our next speaker, Jason Sumners, and we'll be presenting information for the state of Missouri. And Jason is the Resource Science Division Chief for the Missouri Department of Conservation. He has a BS in uh, Fish and Wildlife Science from the University of Missouri and a Master's in Biology from Mississippi State. He has served as a resource scientist for seven years leading Missouri's deer management program and <clears throat> playing an important role in the state's elk uh, reintroduction efforts, initiating private lands deer management program and is leading the department's efforts to develop and implement uh, the CWD management surveillance strategy. 2015, he was presented, or pardon me, he uh, was posted to the Wildlife Division Chief and in June of 2018, he transitioned to his current role as Resource Science Chief. So let's all welcome Jason up to the stage. Thanks for the introduction. Um, happy to be here to tell a little bit about Missouri's story. We've definitely gone the, the, the gamut of um, management approaches hopefully tie a little bit about our thought processes back to some of the presentations we've heard earlier today as well so like many states um, our approach and our goals are not terribly different um, from the beginning it's really been to detect the disease as early as possible in new areas determine prevalence and monitor the distribution of the disease in places where we know it occurs and then apply management actions to limit the further spread and then kind of the fourth approach to, to provide accurate and relevant information. But I think most importantly, at least our agency's focus really has been in terms of surveillance, monitoring, communication, all pointed towards that idea that these need to have a management implication. What management action are we gonna take? So our surveillance approach really is compartmentalized into this, this idea that we're trying to detect at a statewide scale. Um, and I say at a statewide scale, but in places where we have not yet found the disease. And so we've we pretty well define um, regions within the state in which we set targets to try to detect the disease where it's not known to exist. We do that again primarily through the use of taxidermists. We've been doing that since about 2007. And again, those guys are collecting adult males, pretty good distribution, pretty high rate of, of detection. Also using targeted animals, road kills, and meat processors. Meat processors are starting to be a source of us filling in those gaps where we may not have sufficient numbers of taxidermists for, for, uh, for our statewide detection needs. And monitoring within our CWD management zone has taken on the form of mandatory sampling stations, giving us broad scale sampling. We'll talk about that a little bit more, using our regional offices, and then again, a, a pretty intensive uh, ramp up with taxidermists within the management zones. And then a service, as Tammy uh, alluded to, you know, there's folks out there across the state who just want a deer sample. They have concerns about eating them, they have other concerns, and so pretty much statewide, tax service meat processors that are working in the program, somebody can have a place to take a sample to and drop it off. Next slide, please. From the management standpoint, um, we look at it uh, again in several ways. Uh, we have altered regulations within our management zone within our already existing deer season framework. So we have not um, significantly altered our statewide deer season structure uh, to accommodate CWD management. Uh, we have removed the antler point restriction. Antler point restriction was initiated in 2004 to protect yearling males, try to get an older age structure. Uh, in the population as well as increase or, or uh, encourage antlerless deer harvest. We also know that those yearling males are the ones that are dispersing across the landscape and most likely to create new sparks. And so we've repealed the antler point restriction in most places, prohibited feeding like most states, and then increased opportunities for antlerless harvest. Outreach and education focus has been, you know, really on understanding what the disease is, um, but certainly that carcass disposal and carcass movement part of it. What's the anthropogenic chance of spreading this disease across landscape? Hunters ask us how they can help. The big, the big statement is don't move carcasses and improperly dispose of them. That's the biggest risk that, that is presented there. And so to this point, it's been purely educational. We are considering some regulation changes. But then within our core areas where we've detected multiple positives, our primary approach there is to increase opportunities for hunting within the season. Um, as you saw earlier, you know, the, definitely the encouragement of hunters to take deer during the hunting season is the first strategy. The second strategy has been to implement agency-based targeted culling. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But trying to kill those infected deer where they exist as opposed to, to broad scale reduction in deer densities. Next slide. And so our reason for taking this management approach is that we know um, if we do nothing, 
You know, the Wyoming story is a good story to show that it may take some time, um, but eventually there will be um, large scale impacts or likely to be large scale impacts, more sick deer on the landscape and likely the need to reduce harvest of, of a recreationally very important species. So really the only management tool to date uh, that's been proven to be effective is this localized targeted culling program. And so we fully recognize that in a very small targeted geographies that it will result in fewer deer. But the hope is that the area impacted will be much smaller than what would be impacted if we did nothing. And so in terms of a treatment, you're much better to try to tr treat a free-ranging population if it's affected in a small geography than it's spread um, over a tremendous um, area. Next slide, please. So if we look at a little bit of the history of our surveillance approach, um, initiated intensive statewide surveillance in 2002. 2002 to 2004, we had an effort to sample approximately 200 adult deer in each county. Um, that resulted in about 22,000 deer being sampled over that time period. Gave us that kind of baseline that if the disease was present, it was probably present at a relatively low rate. Um, and so it gave us some reasonable confidence that there wasn't a large infection out there um, that was undetected. 2005, 2006 was a period of, of testing sick deer, sick deer and kind of a, a period of transition for us. And as I mentioned earlier, 2007, we really initiated that ramp up of using taxidermist. And so from 2007, really from 2007 to 2010, we collected about 10,000 deer statewide, still no detections. And then our life changed, you know, we all have those moments. I was at home uh, recovering from the flu, woke up from a cold sweat. I probably should have went right back into a cold sweat, uh, but got a message from my supervisor said, hey, uh, I think we have a CWD positive deer. Um, we don't know exactly where yet, but we're working on that. And so that was definitely February 26th of 2010 that changed my life, um, certainly. And so that was our first detection. We'd, we'd tested, you know, about 35,000 deer statewide in the free-ranging population prior to that detection. And so you guys have seen this map. When we look at the map, this is where we thought we stood, the one red dot right in the center of the country, a captive facility, uh, we would later find it outside of that facility, adjacent to the facility for our first free-ranging positive in the winter of 2012. And so we began very aggressively um, tackling the disease um, locally, but also as a result sort of started to, to ramp up our sampling efforts. And over that 2011 to 2015 period, collected about another 22,000 deer. 2014, 2015, we, we detected additional counties and that's reflected here. And so this background of relatively low prevalence or so we thought starting to get additional positives, targeted culling efforts um, in some locations where we knew we had positives, started to raise real questions about where do we, where is it that we don't know it already occurs. And so that really drove a decision to ramp up sampling um, at a very broad scale and we went to this mandatory sampling approach. The state agency has had a history of in-person checking. Uh, until 2004, like many states across the Midwest, we required in-person checking. And with electronic technology, telecheck systems, we backed away from that. But the tradition and the ask of still in-person checking was still there, and so we thought that opening weekend presented a pretty good opportunity to get folks to, to bring us samples. It certainly provided the best opportunity to get a handle on what the distribution was in those counties in which we knew we had the disease or adjoining counties. Allowed us to detect the disease as early as possible. Um, could we detect sparks when there were just a few individuals that we could go in and essentially do surgical strikes and try to remove those social groups before the outer edge of, of the infection um, spread? And then the reality that during no other time could we collect between 18 and 20,000 samples to give us that true broad geographic distribution, which is a huge challenge when trying to detect this disease, define the distribution at a time when we can actually implement some management. And so 2016, we really kicked that effort off. We collected nearly 29,000 samples statewide. 2017, um, just short of 25,000 samples. We just completed our mandatory sampling effort for this year. Uh, mandatory sampling resulted in just over 20,000 samples. 
And this is what it looks like. It is no small endeavor. And I'm not going to sit here and tell every state agency that they could pull this off. Uh, we have the, the benefit of having 1,400 plus employees that work for the agency. Um, regardless of whether you work at a nature center in urban St. Louis or process P cards at central office, the expectation is you participate um, and help the agency in collecting samples. And so we'll, we'll have more than a thousand staff um, dedicated to, to those two day, that two day event. This year was 31 counties. Uh, more than 50 sampling locations, again, more than 1,000 staff. But you can see, based on our current distribution, there's a lot of counties that are affected by the disease. Um, and so, as, yeah, advance the slides. I got confused. Oop, go back one. Back. There we go. Yeah, so as you can see, all those shaded counties there are counties that we have in our management zone, but we cannot possibly sample every one of them on opening weekend. So we really went to those new management zone counties, counties where we've had CWD positive detections, and then those counties that border Arkansas and the, the more recent Iowa introduction. And so trying to, trying to buffer those based on what we see not only going on in the state but outside of the state. So, yeah, next slide. So if we look at what's been going on through time, um, you can see our new positives have been detected in central and southern Missouri. 2006, they're kind of in southern, central Missouri. 2017, we picked up some along the Missouri River south of St. Louis. And then through our recent sampling efforts, we've detected a positive um, in south, far south central Missouri and southwestern Missouri. Some would dr draw the conclusion that that positive in southwest Missouri is... Um, spill over from Arkansas, but I don't know that we're yet ready to, to confirm that that might be the case as well. So we certainly have this history of very intensive testing, very intensive statewide surveillance, but we continue to pick up positives dispersed um, over a great geography. So next slide. So our approach to dealing with these positives when we find them is this focus intensive targeted culling in known areas. Um, again, it's the quickest approach to, to try to limit the spread of the disease. We're talking 30 square miles, you know, less than 30 square miles. So while the map may look, make it look like we've got the disease spread everywhere, the reality is in some very small localized locations. Definitely intensive sampling is essential for this application to work. Um, if we're just kept, testing a few thousand deer each year statewide, we still wouldn't really have a good handle on, on what the distribution of the disease looks like. Our targeted culling operations have been very effective at removing additional positive animals. To date, about 50% of our positives have been removed during the, these winter targeted operations. And so there's no doubt staff going in have the, the ability to, to target social groups um, and remove infected individuals or potentially infected individuals at a much higher rate than even the hunting season um, produces. Next slide. So if we look a little bit about how we implement that, again, our core areas are a one to two square mile buffer around known positive locations. In most situations, this has resulted in about a 30 to 50 square mile core area. Our operations begin as soon as our archery deer season closes on January 15th. We've run through mid-March. This is part of that um, social constraints. Early April, we start turkey hunting and we don't want bait on the ground that would inhibit turkey hunting. And so there's just some practical realities as to when we can, we can effectively implement these things. Uh, we utilize MDC staff, um, trained staff to do much of the shooting. A deviation from the way that Illinois implements this is that we do allow or authorize landowners or designate, designees uh, of the landowner to shoot bait at night, spotlights, thermal scopes. It's pretty much anything that, that you can think of. We try to employ, employ the most effective tools. And so it's been pretty successful. You know, we definitely see, have seen um, differences in the way the local uh, landowners and the public respond to these. Um, initially, there's tremendous landowner support, willingness to shoot deer. They quickly realize that it's not quite as much fun and it's a lot of work. It's cold in North Missouri in February. Let's just be quite honest. And they're not willing to, to put the hours in that are necessary to do it. Um, 
And then some of our areas in southern Missouri we've had over the last three years, we kind of hoping that landowner support continues to be high. They have been um, shooting a lot of deer. And so it, it really becomes a very localized approach in terms of, of our strategy to, to deal with the situation. Next slide, please. And so how effective has it been? Um, we don't know yet. I think our data would definitely suggest that we are at that beginning point of the time of introduction to the time of detection being so critical as your ability to implement tools that have some long-term impact. And where are we on the disease course here? Um, our data would suggest that in our, in our two core areas in Adair County and, and Macon County where we've first detected the disease, probably pretty close to the time of introduction, very, very intense targeted removals for that time period, our prevalence rates are still pretty stable. Um, the concern is, is that we are getting sparks and we're picking those up through our mandatory sampling efforts. Uh, the Macon Lynn County area, you know, again, that first free ranging positive detected in 2012, each of the last three years, we've detected a spark approximately 10 miles from the center of that core area. So we know that's still happening. We may be having some impact on prevalence inside of those core areas, but the geographic distribution is continuing to change. And so that's something that, that I think is a long-term challenge, even with this approach of, of limiting prevalence, because it means that we are spread farther and farther in our attempt to, to control the disease. Another huge question we have is, is if the intensity of our operations are sufficient to impact the population. We know effort in some of these places has declined. Um, there's still deer there, there's still hunting occurring, but with lower deer densities, folks aren't willing to grind it out quite like they used to. And so, um, so we do question whether we're turning the tide or what, what the long-term impacts of that might be. So kind of a quick look using our 2017, 2018 information um, as a view of, of what our annual operation kind of looks like. We had 24,000 samples. 2,700 of those through our statewide surveillance, 2,100 or 21,000 as part of our management zone surveillance, and then about 1,400 samples from targeted culling. We've certainly heard the comments and hear the comments from others that, that they're getting pushed back that they don't want to do what Missouri's doing, shooting thousands of deer in order to control the disease. Um, we have become much more transparent um, in the number of deer we're killing, the locations at which we're killing them, to try to build understanding that this is very targeted and it is a very limited number of additional deer that are being harvested or killed, uh, being culled in the name of CWD management. But again, trying to paint that picture of the importance of these targeted culling efforts. So 33 positives last year, 16 of those hunter harvested, 15 in the management zone, one through statewide surveillance. So again, a taxidermist is picking up a sample where we didn't know we had the disease, our first road kill, and then 16 removed through targeted culling. So that focused intensive removals continues to play an important role. And as of the conclusion of last year, we had 75 positive. That, that number is increasing and, and Brian's map is wrong. Um, as of a couple days ago, got to add another county. So um, continuing challenge. So this is where we set. In 2018, we start to ask ourselves, where do we go? We have pressures from the south border with the, with the large infection that, that exists there um, in Arkansas. We have positives across the northern border in Iowa. Whether, whether that's a spark out of, of our northern infection or something else that's going on. We know the disease is pushing east across the Great Plains, and so we've got and I fear that we've got the disease in northwest Missouri. It's just across the river in Nebraska. Um, and I'm not sure what we know what's going on in eastern Kansas. And so you feel, you feel kind of compressed, right? We've got plenty of things popping up within the state, but certainly things that are, that are pushing from our borders. So next slide. One of the interesting challenges um, that we face is that we are spread pretty far. Um, but if you look at the distribution of positives that we're seeing, and those pink boxes there basically represent our core areas, the red boxes are our positive sections, we continue to have kind of these low prevalence rates in those very small areas. And so we ask ourselves from a surveillance standpoint, 
we really hadn't historically been collecting enough samples to detect some of this stuff. If you're talking about a 30 square mile area in a 700 square mile county, and you got 2% prevalence, you average that over the county, you're talking about like a tenth of a percent prevalence. And so Dr. Samuels presented you the information of how challenging it is to detect the disease. Um, there's either something to say about the utility of even small numbers of samples continually um, that are target animals, particularly adult bucks, that I think that repeated sampling of even 25 or 30 a year from a particular county have tremendous value, um, or we're getting really lucky at detecting the disease, and I, I just don't think that's the case. So next slide. So as we look at this distribution, it certainly cannot be explained um, by natural expansion of the disease. These very small infections are 100, 150 miles from one another, um, not within the normal movement patterns of what we would normally expect from white-tailed deer in, in the central part of the country. Um, and again, at very low prevalence rates. So we continue to scratch our head as to, to what's going on, but it raises the question again of the, of the looking hard or hardly looking concept that, you know, we've been at it for a while and been doing it pretty intensively. At least we think it's been intensive. Um, it surely, to me, draws some questions and concern about the level of confidence of, of the, the no positives in the white areas, right? And has, is this thing continually being introduced, and are we rapidly introducing it, introduced it over the last decade or two through the movement of carcasses, through the movement of, of captive servants? And so as we have progressed through, certainly those are the things we're trying to do in terms of managing the disease where we know we have it. I would believe based on our data and our sampling history that the disease is being repeatedly introduced. Whether it's taking hold or not, we don't know. Um, and so we've been trying to fill the holes in the bucket. Start with the big holes at the bottom and work your way up. Uh, movement of confined cervids, uh, movement of carcass parts, and then you know, those other things, we talk about urine and all that kind of stuff. But to me, those two big things, moving that package of disease, whether it's a live animal or a dead animal, are the, are the biggest holes at the bottom of the bucket. And so over the last several years, um, next slide, go ahead. Though. We've been working on uh, regulations on the movement of confined cervids. Uh, 2014, our Conservation Commission approved rules to ban the importation of deer and elk. Um, that ruling was challenged. Uh, it was challenged as to whether the commission had authority to promulgate rules related to um, confined cervids. And ultimately, 2018, in July of this year, the Supreme Court ruled that deer and elk in Missouri are, in fact, game and wildlife resources of the state and fall under the commission's authority. So that ban on importation was put back into place. So we feel at least that opportunity for new introductions to occur has been rectified. Next slide. The other challenge is movement of carcasses. In 2010, we have implemented interstate restrictions on whole carcasses. It still did provide some exemptions for, for whole carcasses to come in and go to processors and taxidermists, uh, which we have the concern of proper carcass disposal, um, which is an ongoing challenge. But we have not yet addressed the movement of carcasses within a state from a regulatory standpoint. And we are concurrently considering regulations to restrict the interstate movement. As we, as we realize that, that many, many of these deer that are harvested in our CWD positive counties are being harvested by folks who do not live in the county. Um, several of our counties, the vast majority of the deer that are harvested there are harvested by people who do not live in that county. So the opportunity for the disease to continually be moved if improperly disposed of, um, is tremendously high. And so we need to fill that, that big hole in the bottom of the bucket. So next slide. So if we talk about, you know, some of our conclusions, um, really intense sampling is required to detect recent introductions. That, I don't think we can reiterate enough that the time of introduction to the time of detection is probably the, the most critical 
um, thing to, to giving us as state fish and wildlife agencies the most flexibility of trying to have a significant impact on the future course of the disease. We can try to prevent it from getting there to begin with, but, but it's going to happen through unknown sources. What can we do to, to try to detect that disease as early as possible? One more. Um, early detection uh, and this intensive targeted culling appear to be limiting prevalence, but certainly uh, we're seeing that geographic spread. And so I have great concern as to what that will look like through time. And certainly the continued detection of the disease in new locations is just starting to strap us resource-wise. We only got so many staff and we have other responsibilities which creates challenges in terms of what's the priority, what's the real um, priority for staff to be working on. Next. Um, and so again, although the geographic spread is certainly disappointing, we've detected it at relatively low prevalence. So I think through very diligent and thoughtful, consistent surveillance, like we've implemented through using the, the, uh, the taxidermist um, on a broad scale, that you can have a reasonable chance of detecting this disease pretty early in its course. And while it takes time and energy, that, that focused and targeted um, adult male specific sample can be very useful. And so while the surveillance approach may seem somewhat overwhelming, I think there are some bright spots here that, that if implemented diligently can be effective. And so it's unclear, you know, the cause of some of these widespread um, introductions. Ultimately, I don't think it matters. We, we know what and how the disease can and will be introduced. We're just trying to do everything we can to minimize it being introduced in new places and be as proactive as possible to deal with the disease when it, when it does get introduced. Next one. So again, yeah, working hard to try to minimize those new introductions. Um, some might say we've got it in a lot of spots. Um, the path looks murky. We should back away, but I don't think as a state agency we're quite prepared to do that yet. Next one. Um, I will also say that our mandatory sampling has provided us an opportunity over the last three years to annually, personally, our staff engage somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50,000 hunters on opening weekend. And the conversations about chronic wasting disease have been evolving from the groundhog day of tell me again what is CWD, it's not hemorrhagic disease, to more complex and sophisticated questions to try to better understand. So there's been a very positive public outreach um, component to that mandatory sampling effort. I would also say that, um, let's get my train of thought. There's kind of that expectation. The other side of it is the CDC's change in messaging has changed the way we've talked to hunters about testing and about sampling, which has created an increased heightened sense of awareness, um, some cases a sense of concern. It's a little bit of a subtle nuanced message sometimes, um, but that has certainly elevated the conversation and got a lot more folks um, uh, involved. And so as we continue to detect new positives, we continue to have this conversation over and over again, um, that heightened sense of awareness seems to be pretty obvious to us. Next one. And then another important one, we changed a bunch of regulations. Um, some of them very popular. Antler point restriction is probably one of the most popular regulations we ever implemented. And we had to repeal it. It was a good regulation. It was a really, really good deer management tool. And so we started asking some of the questions in our surveys, the human dimensions work, to try to understand what some of the changing responses have been. And over a short period of time in North Missouri, where we first repealed the antler point restriction, there was change in hunter satisfaction, a lot, lot more dissatisfaction with our approach. But as the population has recovered, so have some of those hunter attitudes. And so those localized, very small core areas and some of the grumbling and complaining that is occurring certainly is not impacting overall hunter perceptions and attitudes. They're still more concerned about whether they got deer to shoot um, than they really are about the fact that they no longer have the antler point restriction, that they can no longer feed or put out mineral box and put their trail camera in front of it. So 
there's, there's that true need to use good social survey information to gauge where you are as opposed to just listening to, to public input that you receive and provide that good filter. Um, but again, they seem to be hanging with us at this point. Next slide. And so the hardest part probably about chronic waste disease management is figuring out a way to stay positive about it. We continue to find it in new places, but we, we're finding it at very low prevalence, and the disease is still very rare. So we've sampled 120,000 deer to date, and probably now have you know, close to 90 positives out of that. That's definitely not the story of Wisconsin, definitely not the story of Wyoming. And so how do we continue to encourage folks to stay positive, that the outlook isn't quite as disastrous as some might um, think, um, but it's also important to provide folks a ray of hope because the most difficult conversations we have is with a landowner that has a positive deer and we want to implement targeted culling. That's where the rubber meets the road and that true trust relationship as to whether they're going to support um, further actions. It's not really whether in general hunters support an effort or not. Um, it's what that individual landowner is going to allow you to do or be willing to do. And that's where the real impacts are. And that's where staff trust and staff relationships are absolutely critical. So with that, last slide. Huge thanks to our staff. As I mentioned, this is an all hands on deck approach. Um, mandatory sampling, targeted culling. Our targeted culling efforts will engage three or 400 staff probably across the state. It, it's, it's a wake up in the morning, go to bed thing for most staff, whether they stop at the gas station or go to church. And so, it's certainly a life-changing thing for most state fish and wildlife agencies. Thank you, guys.